Lord about what He would have me speak on today, what He would what He would have to say to you. Um, God has just been taking me on this journey lately, and the thing that He has shown me recently, I did for my own well. Whenever I go to preach, I am typically preaching where I've been walking and what I've been going through. And it's so beautiful as the sister was sharing her story today about what God has done just over these last couple of days as you've been taking this class and how God is faithful and he shows up and sometimes we pray and we don't get the answer that we're looking for, but God takes us through this detour to get us from A to B. It seems like we go to Z to F and, you know, God takes us all this way. And I love the fact that God is weaving together our story and it may look like a mess, but what God is creating in us is something beautiful. And so throughout our stories, we can find grace. And that's what God showed me to bring to you today was that there is this gift, it's beautiful, and it's something that God has for us, and we just need to receive it. It's free, you can't earn it, but it's something that God wants to give to us, and it's wrapped up in this beautiful package called grace. And so that's where we're going to go today. And as I, as I had talked to Abigail about what the conference, I said, you know, is there maybe a theme or something? And the only scripture she, she had mentioned was this one, and it kept coming up to me after she had mentioned the scripture. And I want you to catch this throughout. We're not going to really take this as our text, but I do want to read it to you today because this is woven through all of our stories. And the text is this. If you'll find your Bible and you'll go to 2 Corinthians 4, 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And because I'm old school, if you guys don't mind stand, standing, um, I'm going to read scripture and then we'll pray. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we're going to read through verse 9. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellent of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the reading of your word. I pray that you would take it and that you would bless it. And God, I pray that my speech today, my preaching today would not be with enticing words of man wisdom, man's wisdom, but it would be with demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that I would decrease and that I would not be seen, but Father, that you would be seen and that what you have to say here today would flow through me, not because of me, but because of the empty vessel that this treasure I have in me. Father, anoint your people to receive what you are speaking directly to their hearts. Give them ears to hear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I, as I was praying and as I was reading over that scripture and God, as I was going through the things in my life that I was going through, God spoke to me finding grace. And so today we're going to speak a little bit about finding grace. If you've been in church for any length of time, you, you heard the word grace. We sing about grace, amazing grace. We, we talk, preach about grace. Scripture talks about grace. There's so many scriptures on grace in the Word of God. And churches are named after grace. I had to laugh at myself when I realized the name of the church. I was like, you've got to be kidding me, God. But I chuckled a little bit on that one. But grace defined is the unmerited, unearned favor of God. There is absolutely nothing we can do to earn grace. And there is nothing we can do to deserve grace. The Greek meaning for grace is to endow or to give, provide with special honor, to make favor, to be accepted. The Hebrew word for grace is kindness, special honor, pleasant, well-favored. In short, grace, we receive grace as a gift. It's beautiful. And there's different things. What I, what I learned as I studied this and as I prayed and as I sought the word of God, grace is 
like the package. And inside, there are different measures of grace. There are different things that God gives to us. And we find this throughout Scripture, that grace can all come from God. But what grace is, is the power that God willingly gives to us to do things that we could never do on our own. Standing here today, I'm only here by God's grace because this is never something that I could do on my own. You're looking at a girl who grew up in the Baptist church that said women are to stay silent. We were not to teach. We were not to preach. We were not to... No, you just didn't do that. And it took me so long to, to realize God had a call on my life. And God had more for me. And he wanted to take me to a different place. But So that's God's grace. It's that power that he willingly gives to us. I recently read a story about a husband and a wife who were going on a trip. And they went to the airport. And I honestly have never, full disclosure, never been on an airplane. So I don't really know what it's like in the airport. But this is what I read. So they got to the point of the airport where they have the moving sidewalks. So it's kind of like an escalator, but it's flat. And you just hop on those. So the husband decided he had, you know, his luggage. Wife had her luggage. The husband decided, I'm going to hop on that moving sidewalk and not have to put forth so much effort. And the wife said, uh-uh, I'm going to hoof it. So she decided she'd carry all her bags and she'd go on about her business. Well, the husband said he looked and he just smiled. And he wasn't putting forth any effort. He looked over at his wife and there she was sweating, trying to carry her bags through the airport, trying to get to where she was going. And he just rode. She opted to do it in her own strength. But he decided to take a ride on grace. Sometimes we need to realize what we're doing as we're struggling to get through life. We're trying to do it on our own, huffing and puffing, dragging our suitcases and our baggage through life. And God's saying, look, I got this for you. You just take a ride. Just rest in me. Let me get you to where you need to go. That's grace. But sometimes we want to control what's going on. We want to have the control. We want to put forth our effort. And sometimes we don't even realize that that's what we're doing. But God says today, and I believe he's saying to you today, I want to give you these measures of grace. And there are different circumstances that we go through in life where we need different measures of grace. Sometimes we need a lot of grace. And sometimes we just need a little bit of grace. But we can grow in grace. Grace will strengthen us. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. 2 Peter 3, 18 says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we remember grace, it's that gift. James 1, 7 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of change. God has grace for you, just like he has grace for me. Amen. When we go through life, uh, we, we see people that go through things, and I don't understand how they make it. Sometimes I've been through things in my life, and I don't know how I've made it, but for the grace of God. Several years ago, we went through a season in our, in our home and our youngest son was under such a spiritual attack, a demonic assault, really, it, that I could still see God's hand weaved through it all. Man. And my youngest son was 16 years old at the time. He's 20 now. But he looked at me and he was going through these things at school and he just... He was so miserable and he was so unhappy and he was truly running from the Lord. He really was. But he looked at me with tears rolling down his face and, and I had not planned to share this, but I just feel really like, God, somebody needs to hear this. But he looked at me with tears running down his face. He was like six foot tall at the time, maybe a little taller. And he looked at me, he's a big kid and he's, he's tears rolling down his face and he said, Mama, I don't want to live anymore. And as a mother, to walk through seeing your child that's just done with life, he's got no hope, he's got no, no 
No, nothing. I, he, he was empty of himself. Like he just, he, he felt so done. And it was so bad that he was ready to take his own life. And, and so we, we walked through this season and it's, as, as a mom, that is, was probably one of the most devastating things to ever face, to walk through with my children. But God's grace carried us through. And I'm so thankful for the testimony that he has now. He went from doing drugs, which I had no idea. He went from, you know, just doing all these things that, that I kind of stuck my head in the sand like an ostrich. I prayed for him, but I just didn't want to realize that he was doing. And now God has radically, last year in March, God radically changed his life. He saved him. And, 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 and this child is so different than the man he used to be. He's actually in ministry school now. God, God is doing so much. But see, that's God's grace weaved in our lives. And if we will allow God, he will just bring us to the place where he has us. Though we may be crushed, though we may be persecuted, though we may feel like everything is falling apart, God's grace is there for us as a free gift and so as I began to pray, God spoke to me and he said, you know, tell the people what grace does for you. And the first thing that, that, that grace does for us, which most of us all know, it saves us. Grace is like a life preserver that pulls us out of a raging, stormy water. Grace saves us. Titus 2, 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. God is there like a life preserver with his grace to save us. There may be someone here and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. And this is what scripture says. It says, for by grace are you saved. You can't earn it. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't make your way to get there. All you do is by faith. Put your faith in Jesus, the Son of God, who loved you so much that he gave himself for you. Grace saves us when we cannot save ourselves. You're not going to earn your way to heaven. You're not going to be good enough to make your own way there. But if you will accept through faith the gift that he has given us, grace will save you. And then God told me, he said, Stacy, grace will strengthen you. Grace is going to strengthen you. 2 Timothy 2, 1 says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. When he gives you that gift of grace, it will strengthen you. There are times when we have to wait on the Lord. And that's what it says in Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Grace will strengthen us. It will strengthen us in times of waiting. It will strengthen us in times where we feel crushed and broken. And then God began to take me to the word of God and to scriptures and to people whose stories are laid out for us all throughout the word of God. And I've been accused before of preaching the whole Bible. And so why not do that today? <laughs> so we're going to go from the front all the way to the back. Scripture is full of people who were given the gift of grace. It's full of people who lived out the story of grace weaved throughout the word of God. And the first character in scripture, I want you to see what grace did for him is Noah. Yep. Noah is found in Genesis 6 verse 8. And it says simply this, Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That but is a big word. Because see, what was happening was in Noah's day, there was all kinds of violence and all kinds of evil. The earth was full of every kind of sin you could imagine. Truth be told, it sounds a lot like the time we're living in today. Scripture says that as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the day the Son of Man comes. 
Noah's day was evil. And God was sorry that he ever had created man. But as God was looking over the earth, he saw this one man named Noah. Was Noah perfect? No. Was Noah sinless? No. But scripture says in verse 9 of of Genesis 6 that Noah walked with God. He was inclined to God. He had a heart that remembered God despite all the violence and all the evil that was going on around him. And so God looked down and he said to Noah, Noah, this is what I want you to do for me. Noah was in a world filled with wickedness, yet Noah stood and did what God said. How difficult would that be? How is that even possible that you would start, okay, I'm going to do what you said, and he's going to go take the wood, and he's going to start building this big boat, and there had never been rain, and, and people would pass by and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm building an ark. Well, what's an ark? Well, it's a, it's something that's going to float because there's going to be water. Well, they didn't understand. It didn't make sense. But see, what happened was God gave Noah grace. God gave Noah a strength to do something that he did not have his own ability to do. God gave Noah strength that was in the form, grace that was in the form of strength. Noah stood and he preached. And, 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 and we need that in our day and time. We've got to stand up for truth. We've got to stand up for right. For so long, the church has been silent. We've let the world do its thing. We've sat back. We've worried about my four and no more. The harvest has been perishing. The fields, the, the fruit has been dying on the vines. And we've not done anything to go out and get it. We've just sat silently. But God has been sounding an alarm. I've got that shirt out there. God has been sounding an alarm saying, church, it's time to wake up. You've been asleep for far too long. Wake up. It's time to do the work of the Lord like Noah did. God is giving us. He's saying, I have this grace. I have the strength for you to stand in the evil day. I have the strength for you to stand when persecution comes. I have the strength for you. Will you accept it? Or will you keep doing your own thing? Carrying your own your own baggage and doing it in your own effort. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord was looking at Noah. Will you find your grace today? The next scripture that the Lord took me to was the story in 1 Samuel 1, and it was the story of Hannah. Hannah was just a little woman. Nobody really knew, but God saw her. God saw Hannah's need, and God gave grace to Hannah. Hannah was barren. Oh, Hannah wanted a baby. Hannah wanted a baby to hold in her arms and to love and to raise. Hannah wanted a child. Hannah's husband, I can't remember how to say his name, um, starts with E, had had another wife, Penias or something like that, another hard name to say, had another wife and she would just aggravate, aggravate, be ugly to Hannah. Oh, I've got kids, but you don't. She would, she would persecute her. She would say things that was difficult for Hannah to hear. And Hannah was so heartbroken. It was not Hannah's choice to be in the situation she was in. She didn't choose that, but there she was. She was barren and she desperately wanted a child. And what she did was she went to the father. She went to where her help came from and she went to God in prayer. She begged God and she wept and she cried and God gave her grace to birth a man named Samuel. First seven, eight, or first Samuel 1 verse 19, the very last word, words of the verse says, and the Lord remembered her. She cried out to God and God gave her grace. You may be dealing with a circumstance or a situation in your life 
that only God can move. Only God can do it. And we need God to give grace in that situation. In our desperation, God will remember and he will hear you. Naomi, very similar to Hannah, is found in Ruth chapter 1 through 4. In Ruth 1, it says, the name of the man, they left their city. It says, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of the son Melhan and Chilion. They were Ephrites from Bethlehem and Judea, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. There was a famine in the land, and they left their land, and they went to a foreign country. Naomi did not ask to go to Moab, but her husband made a choice, and they went to Moab. And while in Moab, she lost her husband. And a little bit later, she lost her two sons. There are so many times, and I see people all the time who are dealing with grief, who are dealing with loss, who are dealing with what could be a very root of bitterness to come up in their life, just like Naomi. Not because of circumstances that you have put yourself in, but because of circumstances that have been outside of your control. And that happens so many times in our life. But if you will look at the story of Naomi, she was a victim of this circumstance, but what was she to do? She was left with what felt like nothing. And scripture says when she came back, she made a decision to go back to Jerusalem. She went back home to her homeland. And as she came back home, the women came out and they greeted her and they said, oh, it's so good to see you, Naomi. And she says, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And because of this circumstance, this root of bitterness starts, started to grow up and it started to produce fruit in her life. But God was weaving his grace in her story through this little girl that had married, this little Moabite girl that had married one of her sons in the land of Moab named Ruth. And so Ruth had traveled back, and Ruth was a gift. She was a gift of grace. It didn't look like it at the time, but that's what she was. Ruth was what was inside that package of grace. And so God, what happened is, is and I encourage you, if you don't know the story, go back and read the story of Ruth. But Naomi went from four very short chapters from bitter from being Mara, she went from being that to being the great, great grandmother of King David, who would who would birth through that through his line the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Her story of circumstance that she did not choose was used for the glory of God. And I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. I've got several that I really want to get to. But the next one that God took me to is in 2 Samuel 23. And that was David's mighty men. God's grace is weeped through the story of David's mighty men. And if you think about mighty men, these are men of valor. These are men who, who have fought. These, you would think that they were trained warriors, right? If you go through the story, you've got uh, a man who slew giants. You've got a man who, one of the, one of the uh, mighty men slew a man with 12 fingers and 12 toes. They slew giants. There was one who fought uh, uh, in a pit. He fought a lion on a snowy day. We learned these things through scripture about David's mighty men. They fought and they advanced the kingdom. They, they won victory after victory, battle after battle. Have you ever wondered where these mighty men came from? Does anybody know where those mighty men came from? I'm going to tell you. This blew me away. 1 Samuel 22 verse 1. David, this was before David had the kingdom, before he had his mighty men. This is how his mighty men came to him. In David, or in 1 Samuel 22 verse 1, it says, David therefore departed from, the, from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house had heard it, they went down to him. Verse 2, this is where the mighty men come in. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented, 
gathered to him. So he became captain over them. And there was about 400 men. Here David is remembering the promise that God gave him that he was one day going to be a king. And here comes this huge band of misfits. Everybody who's in debt. Everybody who's distressed. Everyone who was discontented. And David became captain over them. See, they knew where to go. They knew that what who was their king was not really their king. So they went out and they sought to find the real true king. And what happened was God weaved his grace. He weaved his strength into their story. And what happened was they went from depressed, distressed, in debt, discontented, to mighty men of valor. If we will find the right place to follow and let God weave his grace and accept his grace through our story, we will go from being broken and wounded and discontent and distressed if we will follow after the right king and receive his grace. In the New Testament, Paul, it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 7, Paul was a man who was terrible persecuted the church, but God's redemptive grace saved him and he began to preach and share the gospel. So many things can be said about Paul. Paul teaches us about grace in 2 Corinthians 10, 7. And he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above all measure. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded to the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And in verse 10, the last part says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. There are times when we are doing right in our life, we're doing good in our life, we're doing, we're going along and something hits us, bam. And we ask God, God, would you take this pain? Would you take this heartache from me? But it seems like God is not listening. Well, maybe he's listening, but he's just not doing the thing that you think he should do and removing it. And so was the case of Paul. Paul reminds us, though, that no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, that his grace, his gift, what's in there, it's all you need. It's all you need. I'm going to skip a couple. The last one I want to share with you is just the woman that was caught into adultery. One of the most beautiful accounts of grace is found in John 8. And that was when Jesus was teaching in the temple. As he was teaching in the temple, some Pharisees, some rulers brought this woman and they dropped her right in front of them. And they said she was caught in the act of adultery. She made her choices. She knew what she was doing was wrong. And they all had these stones in their hand. And they were ready to cast them because that's what the law called for. The law called for death for someone who was caught in the act of adultery. And they were ready to take her out. But Jesus' response was profound and filled with grace. He looked at the men, whoever was there to stone her. And he said, let him, and sometimes women will have those stones in their hand. And we are real good for that because we're going to sit in judgment of other women if they're not doing or if their sins are put out there for everybody to see. And we need to repent for that. Just like, amen, amen. That was a little rap trail for you. Jesus said, and he looked at these, these who had these stones and he said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And he bent down and he wrote on the ground. And then it was heard one by one. Their stones were dropping on the ground. And he stood up and he looked at the woman and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said to the Lord, she said, No one. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's grace. Grace is receiving a free gift. That was the gift of mercy. 
It was the gift of mercy that she didn't receive what she deserved. She didn't receive what the law called for. But she was set free from her sin that very day when Jesus said, go and sin no more. That's grace. When do we need grace? The first time we need grace is when we're tempted to sin. So many times we will be tempted. The enemy will put something in our path. Something will come up. But Romans 5.20 says, More over the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Sometimes we have a choice. And we know, should we do this or should we do that? That's when we need grace. Amen. We need grace when we need wisdom James 1.5 says that we lack wisdom to ask our God and he will give it generously to us. We need grace when we are hurting. Yes. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, For blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort. There's a gift of grace. And inside that grace is comfort. It says he comforts us in all of our affliction so that we can comfort others when they are afflicted. He gives us grace when we're hurting. When we're weary, we need grace. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. In Galatians 6, 9, one of my favorite verses says, let us not be weary in well-doing for we shall reap if you faint not. Grace will be given to us in the form of rest when we're weary. I know there are so many who work in the, in the ministry. They work in the church. They work outside the church. We have pastors that day in and day out are leading their sheep, protecting their sheep, fighting off the wolves, doing everything they can. And it's so easy to become weary. But God is saying, if you're weary, come to me because I'm going to give you that grace that you need to keep going, to not faint. We need grace when we are broken. Amen. I think about when that woman who was caught in the act of adultery was laid there at the feet of Jesus. I'm sure she was thrown there in the dust and in the dirt. And as she was thrown there, I just think about her being so broken and so hurt. We need grace when we are broken. There's a song, I'm sure many of you know it, I actually heard it playing just a little bit ago, called Gracefully Broken. And it says this, I wrote the lyrics down, it says, Here I am, arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken. All to Jesus now, I'm holding nothing back, I surrender. When we truly surrender, we find freedom. And it's through grace. We need grace when we realize we cannot do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. And God, this one right here, y'all, God has been, oh my goodness, it's been speaking to my heart. Galatians 2, 19 through 21 tells us this. I'm just reading a little portion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And it says, I live by faith in the Son of God. We need grace when our eyes are open to the fact that we cannot do it on our own. And to sum it all up, when do we need grace? Every moment of every day. We all need grace. And lastly, as I'm wrapping up, if y'all want to play a song or or however y'all want to do it, the last thing 
is how do we find grace? Noah found grace. If we're finding grace, how do we find grace? This is what God began to speak to me. The first way we find grace is to pray. It's real simple, y'all. It's not hard. We need to pray. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We find grace through our worship. Psalms 22 says, Thou art holy, and thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. He inhabits us. It draws him near to us when we, when we worship him. When we lift his name on high, I feel like heaven just draws near to us. And it takes our eyes off of our circumstances and the things that are difficult and the fact that we're being crushed and the fact that we feel broken. It takes our eyes off those things and it puts our eyes on the one whose name is worthy. And on the one whose name is above every name. And things start to change within you because you start to receive that grace. We find grace through the Word of God. The Word says that He gives us revelation. As we read the Word, it says, It is written that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things that God has revealed to us through the Spirit, the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. As we get into the Word, as we read the Word, as we get revelation from the Word of God, from the Holy Spirit, we find grace. We find grace by living in His presence, having intimacy with the Father. He said, into me see intimacy with God. He wants you to see his heart. He wants you to see into him. Intimacy. Living in his presence. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He wants you to have intimacy with him. And the last thing, the last way we find grace is opening up to receive his grace. God, I surrender. God, here I am. Here I am. I can't do it without you. I realize I give everything to you. James 4, 6 says, He gives more grace. God opposes the proud. He doesn't want you to try to do it on your own. But it says He gives grace to the humble. He wants you to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. And receive his grace. You've been saved by grace through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. And it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound in you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. When you receive and start finding grace. It starts to change the way you talk. It changes the way you walk. It changes the way you live. Not just in front of everybody. Not what everybody sees or everybody perceives of you. But it changes you in your home. It changes you in those moments. When you're all by yourself. And nobody knows you. Nobody knows what's really inside. But God, because he looks on the heart and he sees what's in here and he's looking. He's looking at your heart. Last year, God began to reveal some things to me and he began to show me some things. And this is just part of my story. and It's part of my testimony. And God told me through a series of events I had went to a, a women's retreat and we had gotten baptized in the lake and God began to speak to me about the depth of the water and how we all have different depths of our relationship with the Father. And so, you know, some people will stand just watching 
and observing. And then some people want a little taste of what God has for them. So they'll they'll just peep their toes into the water. And some will go out a little deeper and and then some will go out a little deeper and some will go waist deep. The scripture talks about this. But some will be waist deep in the water. After we got baptized, we were waist deep in water and we went back to the house and we were at a lake house and there was a boat dock. And on the boat dock, my friends decided they wanted, we were still in our baptized clothes, you know, we were in like regular clothes. And we decided everybody wanted to jump in the water. Well, I'm not a very good swimmer. So I was like, well, I'll, I'll peek down in there. So I climbed down the ladder. And I'm holding on to the ladder. And everybody's out there having a good time swimming around, floating. And I watch my friends. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll let go just a little bit. So I, I let go of the ladder and, and went out here. And I got a little scared. So I came back and I was pulled back to the dock. And the dock was sucking me under. It was very uncomfortable. Just saying. I was out in the deep water. But I needed that security. I needed that control. And so God began to say, Stacy, I want to take you deeper. You're in the deep, but I need you to let go of the ladder. So I said, okay, God. Took me a little while. But I finally made the decision that I would receive the grace to let go of the control and let go of the ladder. And I said, God, where you want me to go, I will go. What you want me to do, I will do. I surrender. I give it to you. So fast forward to 2022. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm doing doing, doing what he, he's, he's telling me to. And we get to 2022, and I look up the Hebrew year, and it's the year of the sabbatical. It's the year of rest. It's the year of pouring into. And so I'm so excited. I'm like, oh, God, this is the year you're going to pour into me. I'm going to rest in you. Oh, it's going to be such a good year. I'm just so looking forward to it. And then we start through 2022, and I think things are going to get better. I'm going to rest. I'm going to just just relax and float in the river of God in His own strength. By His grace, I'm just going to rest. And then things start to happen. And difficulties start to come. And I start to feel crushed. And I start to feel just tossed around by the sea of life. And God started to speak to me just within the last couple of weeks. And he said, Stacy, are you resting? I started to realize that I was losing my joy. I started to realize that I was losing my peace. I started to realize that I was losing my hope. I was losing all these things because of my circumstances. I was getting crushed. I was getting pressed. See, we've been praying for this answer to prayer for about seven years. This thing in my life that I don't feel ready to share just yet, but this thing that we've dealt with and this thing that we've been experiencing and we've prayed, almost like the thorn that, that Paul had. God, would you just remove this? God, would you just, would you move? Would you show up? Would you do this? And I thought, oh, we're almost there. We're almost to the promise. God, I know that you're faithful. I know that you're going to come through. I know you're going to lift this burden. But it didn't. We're still there. Still praying. Still believing. But God began to show me, Stacy, you remember that story of the, the husband who was riding on the moving sidewalk and the wife, there she was, Sweating, huffing, puffing, carrying her own baggage to get to where she was going. And he said, Stacy, that's what you're doing. You're striving. He said, you're doing it in your own self. You're losing all these gifts that I've given you in the depth of the water that you're in. You're starting to sink because you're trying to do it by yourself. You're doing it in your own self. And I, I believe that God has spoke this to me today. He highlights these things in my life because I'm not the only one. 
again. If you're running on fumes today, if you feel like you're in the midst of the storm, if you feel like it says in 2 Corinthians 4, hard pressed, if you feel perplexed, if you feel persecuted, if you feel forsaken, if you feel struck down, See, what's really cool about the process of purification or even the process of olives to get the oil out, to make the anointing come, they have to be crushed. They have to be pressurized. For diamonds to become diamonds that start out as big lumps of coal, there has to be some pressure. There are things and circumstances in our life that we go through. God gives us, I gave you all those examples today of people of faith, people throughout the word of God to show you that your story matters. People will see things in you that are going to point them to Jesus. If you will allow God's grace to weave into your life. So today, if you feel that crushing, you feel that pressing, and you feel like God just wants to give you a a little gift, whether you need rest because you're weary, whether you need strength because He's got a job for you to do that you don't feel like you can do in yourself, whether you need mercy, God says, I have this gift for you. I just want you to receive it. So if you will stand, every head bowed, every eye closed.